The last topic in our structural equation modeling set of lectures is item response theory or item factor analysis. Now, we could do an entire course on item response theory, um, but in this case, we're going to cover uh, the basics of IRT and then how you can run a simple dichotomous IRT and a polytomous one. Um, with the caveat that they do get much more complicated and understanding the math behind them becomes rather crucial if you're going to do um, a lot of IRT analyses, uh, especially when they break and you don't know why. But this lecture is going to cover the basics and then the example will show you some a place to get started, really. So it's kind of a new issue and it feels a little tossed into this book, but it's nice because it does cover um, a conceptual problem with some, with some sim, is what happens if your outcome variable, your manifest variables are dichotomous um, or categorical. So oftentimes we treat uh, Likert scales, those one to seven bad boys or one to five as continuous and maybe we shouldn't. Um, and so what do you do if your outcome is dichotomous? What if you're working with a scale that the answers are true, false, or yes, no, for example? Um, do we still assume that that underlying latent variable is continuous? If the answer is yes, this is inappropriate. If you assume that the latent variable or the circles in your model are dichotomous as well, this is not appropriate. So it assumes that the latent variable is continuous. And then what do I do with values that I should treat as categorical? So what if I have ordinal data? Um, this really is a better way to analyze it than even using some of our alternative um, math procedures that we talked about in estimation. So most with a star <laughs> agree that if you have at least four response options, so uh, on a scale of like a personality measurement, if you have at least four choices from strongly agree to strongly disagree, you can be, you can kind of treat that as continuous without a loss of power interpretation. But maybe that's not the focus of what you're interested in. Maybe you are interested in if the items are ordered meaning people with low scores really do pick the lowest options, or if um, items are even any good. So it might be that the items are good, but only for people at the top end of the scale. An EFA, traditional EFA, would not tell you that. It would just tell you that the item was good. Okay, so to me, the real distinction between these two types of analyses we're going to talk about, item factor and item response, first from EFA, the distinction is the manifest variable is treated as categorical. So that's the big split there. But then which one do I pick, item factor or item response theory? That to me is a theory-based distinction. So let's get into these a little bit more. Okay. So these are two approaches that allow us to analyze the data with categorical predictors. There are more options like log regression as well, but that's really more of a simple regression analysis. So we could treat this as item factor analysis or item response theory. And on a basic level, the math is very similar. And when you have um, dichotomous or two outcomes, they are mathematically transferable. Um, however, the, the traditional uses of them are very different. So one big issue, and this is where I said that IRT can get very complicated, is um, unidimensionality. Okay. Generally, both of these analyses types are for one factor and one factor only because you're estimating the underlying latent and where each item measures best on that latent. Um, if you have multiple factors, you could split them up into separate analyses. Or you can look at a multidimensional IRT or IFA. Um, and the MERT <laughs> plugin for R will do that for you. And um, it has lots of examples on how to do that, but we're not going to get into multidimensionality. Instead, we're going to just focus on a unidimensional scale, so one factor only. Another issue is local independence. Um, and the idea is that. The reason that the answers on their manifest variables are correlated is because of the latent variable. 
So they're scoring these specific scores because they have this um, underlying ability or underlying personality or whatever. Um, and then after you control for that, their items are uncorrelated. And that's very similar to MTMM in the sense of if I, once I control for traits, the methods should really be uncorrelated because it shouldn't be, you shouldn't be getting answers due to the methods. Um, that's just bad science. Um, but same idea here is that once we control for participant ability, items are not related to each other. So you can kind of check for this in a simple way by looking at the modification indices and seeing if items have expectedly high residual, um, like it would want to add a big residual correlation that would imply that those items are not separate. Um, we won't get into that too much, but that is another assumption of running one of these analyses is local independence. There are ways to test for both of those. Um, and I would tell you to look at some um, other videos on YouTube that cover those a little better um, if you're interested in those topics. So which one would you pick? So would you pick item factor or IRT? And I would argue that item factor analysis, uh, although not super popular, is a more traditional factor analysis approach where you're going to be focusing on does the item load on my factor? Can I eliminate bad items? Um, how do they load? And then here, testing for multidimensionality is actually more of, of a focus. How many factors are there? And how do these questions load on those factors, traditional rotation ideas, etc. Um, so this is more of an EFA approach, but the outcome is dichotomous. IRT is more of a test theory approach. So um, education focuses really have had the handle on this for a long time, and I feel like um, psychology kind of ignored it or at least the part of psychology that I was in, just in the sense that it, it wasn't the focus. We were designing scales and we wanted to know that the scale worked and if it was an ed-focused ed design, they could look at classical test theory, um, where we would um, focus on whether those items were any good and where they were any good. But it's really, I think, picking up steam in the sense that it is easier to run now. There are specific programs that will do this for you that you can pay for or you can use R. Um, and it's making it a little more approachable for folks. Um, because what it lets you do is examine items um, in a totally different way. So with EFA, I am focused on do they load and what factor do they load on and can I make an interpretation of how they load it. Right, it's a simple solution. With IRT, I'm looking at, is it a discriminable item? So can I tell the difference between people who are low scores and high scores with this particular question? Or does it not really discriminate and answers are all over the map? Um, what is the location of this item? So location just means like, where are people scoring? So what is the spot the magic sweet spot at which people are getting it wrong or people are getting it right. Um, so for right now, I'm gonna focus on, on correct and incorrect answers because that's the easiest way to learn this. The very end will cover um, categorical outcomes um, like your Likert scales. Okay. So location, sometimes called theta or ability, is just the estimate of where um, like where on the range of people's scores are you likely to see a split where these people are gonna get wrong and these people are gonna get right. That is a log regression. So where, but it's, it's not a 50-50 chance. This tells you where that chance is. So with log, what we do is we say, um, this variable discriminates between group one and group two. And then, you know, you sort of estimate whether and what group they go into but with this particular analysis, what I'm doing is I'm figuring out where that estimate split happens. So instead of it being 50-50, I might say, well, it's more like 75-25. So this allows me to see where the item is good at measuring folks. And to me, that's super interesting uh, for reasons I'll get to when I get to polytomous items. It also allows you to account for guessing. So guessing in a multiple choice exam is pretty important because uh, if items are equally guessable, 
you might have a one in four chance, right? On a four, four choice, forced multiple choice. But let's say two of them are totally ridiculous. So now they have a 50-50 chance of getting it right, which really changes whether or not it's discriminable and where it's discriminable at, so the location. Um, sometimes items have a zero guessing um, because they're so difficult that guessing just is totally eliminated. So even random guessing isn't very good. Um, so that's an interesting thing to ask. Um, if we're going to consider more than two outcomes, we can look at ordering. So if I have a one to seven scale, do people who pick one make the lowest scores, followed by two and then three, etc.? Or sometimes do people who have lower scores pick five? And that's not a good thing for your scale. Um, the use of response options, which is sort of chi-squarish, um, do people equally pick our response options? Um, and then thresholds between those options, which is simply the point at which people pick one versus two versus three and etc. So you can find a sort of a range of your latent variable that people are likely to pick that item. And that to me is also very interesting because then I can use that to do other things. So IRT to me just gives you loads of information that you don't get from a factor analysis because the approach, if you think about everything I just said, the approach between these two is very different. The purpose of them anyway. Mathematically, they're actually pretty much the same, which is kind of surprising if you think about it. Okay. Okay. So it is a regression style approach, just like the whole semester. Uh, both analyses are um, analogous to log regression. So that means that the data we're going to be dealing with is going to be transformed, likely in a logit. So logit is your traditional log regression, inverse cumulative transforms or probit regression. And so what happens is when we'll look at curves like this, you get these S curves if the item is good. If the item is poor, you get a flat line. But the bottom here, and this is the, this is the difficult part for people, is um, ability. So this is generally called ability. Sometimes it's called theta um, or uh, location, just to be confusing. So three different names for the same thing. But you can think of the x-axis here as your latent variable. Think about what we've done all year. We've made bubbles to predict the reason that they're getting the answer on whatever question. So the manifest square variable. So the bubble is X. It predicts why I got this question right or wrong. And so what we're doing is taking, if they got it right or wrong, and sort of reversing that and figuring out where are they on this latent variable that they got it right or wrong. So are they really smart and they got the item right because they're really smart? So over here. Or are they um, right on the average and they got the item right because it's an easy question? So it really like allows us to um, see who and where it's assessing people best. So then if I'm thinking about this from a testing perspective, I can pick items that measure all along different abilities. So that if you get these items correct, I can correctly predict um, the, the ability of you. So I can estimate your latent score. So switching back to atom factor analysis kind of quickly, the latent variable is assumed to be continuous, but that's true of everything we've done. And the items are treated as coarse representations. So um, anytime you're dealing with uh, dichotomous or categorical outcomes and you're not, uh, or I'm sorry, manifest variables, and you're not measuring a full continuum, it really is a coarse representation. Because when we have those one to seven scales, we force people often to pick four or five, um, unless you are using a sliding scale on, online. Um, and so maybe they really do feel like four and a half, but you haven't given them that option. So coarse meaning they're not the best, most distinguishable representation of a latent score. Um, the threshold that you get is the point at which people get it right. Um, so in this particular example, uh, let's say that everyone on the left side here is getting it wrong, and this is the point at which they're getting it right. And so um, 
this isn't necessarily best represented by a histogram, but the idea is that um, everyone on this side is getting it correct and everyone on this side is getting it wrong. So only, you know, like 5% uh, of the population out here is going to get that correct. Uh, but the way item factor analysis actually runs is on tetrachoric correlations. So when you have dichotomous items, what you can end up with, if you have uh, multiple items, this table gets bigger. But the idea is a little two by two tables between, between items. So for item one here, I either got it correct or incorrect. So let's say I got it right. For item two, there's a 5% chance that I will get it wrong. And then for item two, there's a 66% chance if I got item one right, I'll get item two right. So this is kind of a conditional probabilities. Um, if I miss the first item, I am 3% likely to get the second one wrong as well and 20% likely to get it correct. So depending on how I score, I can predict what the next one is. So what you do is you look at the correlation between diagonals here, either way, and we're looking at um, matches here. So if I get both of them wrong or both of them right, or the first one wrong and the second one right, and vice versa. And so the tetrachoric correlations are the correlations between the diagonals, um, which indicates like kind of the patterns of relationships that you would have, um, given that it's the only two options. So this is a limited information method. We've been talking about full information methods all year um, because instead of using the raw data for item factor analysis, what we do is transform it into a tetrachoric correlation table first, or the computer does anyway. And then it is estimated from that correlation table. EFA and most of SIM is estimated from covariances or correlation tables anyway, um, but there are full information methods but this particular type of data does not allow for that. So you would use a different estimation method than ML because ML is for normal data and this is clearly not normal. So the kind of the best options that you have that are part of packages we've been working with are weighted least squares, means, and weighted least squares, means, and variances. Okay, so we want to use weighted least squares um, because it tends to work the best. Um, and so the way that it estimates is called marginal or delta or standardized parameterization, depending on who you talk to. Okay. And the issue with running these types of analyses is that they're under-identified. Um, so the way that you solve that problem is you constrain their variance to one instead of using a marker variable. Okay. Oops, excuse me, because with marker variables, we've been tending to set them to one, but now we're talking about distribution of, of probabilities instead of a distribution of data. And so um, really we have to constrain the variance to one as part of the, the, the standardizing on the latent variable. So we're saying, well, there's only so, you know, probability is zero to one, so we're going to constrain that variance to one, and so we're, we would use a standardization on the latent variable instead of using um, a marker variable for scaling. Okay, and that's the most common approach for this type of analysis. You can also use conditional or theta or unstandardized parameterization. Okay, so these are two different options, and it would constrain the error variance to one. That is not nearly as common as constraining the latent variable to one. Um, you can scale by using a marker variable or using latent variable stand, um, standardization, and this is common because it sets the latent variable mean to zero um, and the variance to one, which will then give you the loading for each item. So how well does it associate with the factor and the threshold? And the threshold is the, the point at which people are getting it right versus wrong. Okay, so it's the ability. Um, so the sort of house, if you want to think about ability as smarts, that'll help until you kind of get a better grasp on this. But like who's getting it right and wrong? So it picks the 50-50 point at which they get it right versus wrong. 
Okay, so that's the end of item factor analysis. Let me talk some about IRT. Now, item response theory, and this is actually really the focus of this lecture, but I'm presenting it in comparison to item factor analysis because, you know, mathematically, meh, they're the same. Um, but I feel like the focus of them is so different that you wouldn't just be like, ah, oh, well, they're the same, pick one. Okay. So IRT is a traditionally used counterpart to classical test theory. So with classical test theory, um, uh, you can do reliability and item correlations and then um, estimate from there. So we've done Chromebox Alpha on many scales, so that's classic test theory, you just didn't know it. Um, it also says that your score, so my score on an exam or on one of these personality measures is, my, is a true score of my, so it's a true representation of me, whatever that is, so ability, plus some error. But I can't really separate the fact that I took the test from the test. So with classic test theory, it's sort of like there's the test and there's my score and those are conflated with each other. I have a hard time separating test characteristics and person characteristics. So, um, and it doesn't really account for a lot of, 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 of issues with person characteristics. So to give an example of what I mean by test versus person. Let's say you have a three item questionnaire and I totally stole this from a previous graduate student who presented this in a talk about his thesis and because it just really very clearly um, edifies the problem. Okay. So let's say you either get it right or you get it wrong and there's three items. So you think with three items it cannot possibly be that complicated, but there are four total scores. I can get them all wrong or all right and eight total response patterns. Okay. So I can get them all wrong. The last one wrong, the second one, I'm sorry, the last one right, the second one right, the first one right, the first two, last two, the first one and last one, or all of them right. So there are eight different possible person characteristics, right? Only four total scores. So what happens is that anyone who made a three, well, there's only one option for that, but there are three options for you to score two, three options for you to score a one, and then zero. So for people who are scoring one and a two, I can't t distinguish between them. Um, and this really, um, before I go on to the curves here, this really to me is a big problem with uh, measures of, I, I wanna say personality, I'm kind of making that as a global term, but let me pick on a research field that I work in. So uh, my friend who does lots of work on meaning in life, um, we have a real problem sometimes we're using our scales because people tend to pick the ends. So they love everything, everything's great, everything's wonderful, yay, 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 or they hate everything and life sucks and life is terrible. Okay, so that really presents a bimodal issue. Um, but what I can't tell is for people who pick, um, let's say for some unknown reason, people are likely to pick the first set of ones as all happy and the second set of ones as all sad they're gonna get the same total score as people who pick all the first ones as unhappy and all the second ones as happy. And clearly those are very distinct patterns of responses, but the test cannot tell the difference because we take a, a total or an average score. However, if I focused on the person patterns, it could tell a difference. So the really nice thing about IRT is that I can look at test characteristics and those person response patterns. So it creates a different score for people depending on their patterns versus just an average test score on an exam. Okay. And so let's say for some reason you have, you're giving, one more example, um, giving an exam in a class and uh, you have plenty of people who get all the easy questions right and then they can't get any of the hard ones. Uh, uh, they miss all the hard ones. <coughs> so they're making a B because they miss a couple of the hard ones. Now you have a person who's scoring really well in the class and so they get all the hard ones right but they miss a couple of the easy ones because they're not paying attention. They're both gonna make Bs, but you can't tell the difference between them and, and give them more points for getting the hard ones right if you're using traditional test scoring methods. If you're using an IRT, you can. Okay. This is very similar to the way any standardized test works, especially the GRE, the LSAT, the SAT, those items are scored based on their difficulty and they know difficulty because they've tested them using these these methods. Okay. All right. 
So what kind of things do I expect to see or am I going to be analyzing? Okay. And one thing we'll look at is an item characteristic curve. Okay. So ICCs are going to be in a dichotomous design are going to be these S-shaped curves if the item is any good. You're, don't confuse this with the item information curve, which is going to be a little different. So the item characteristic curve is the, a, log, a logistic curve where um, theta here or ability is going to be on the x-axis and the probability of a correct response is going to be on the y-axis. So probability will range from 0 to 1. And ability over here, usually the people put uh, negative 3 to 3 because this is a z-score. So you can think about ability here as 0 is average, 3 is very high, and negative 3 is very low. So this is a, a z-score of whatever you're interested in. So ability could be IQ, it could be meaning in life, it could be Swiss cheese. Okay, so ability here is a, a, a basic term, or theta, um, is a overall term of um, the latent variable that you're interested in here. So this is latent. This is why sometimes it's called theta, ability, or location. So all three of those mean the same basic idea. So theta is our ability, our underlying va latent variable score, so that depends on what you're testing. Um, I think ability is an easy way to think about it if you're thinking about IQ or scores on a test, but if you're testing um, something more like meaning, that when ability doesn't make sense. So the first thing we're going to do is talk about item location, or the B parameter. Okay. So we're going to use A, B, and C. They have no relation to um, other A's and B's and C's. Okay. So let's say I have two different items here, one in blue and one red. And B is the location, or the ability score. Or if you really want to think about this in a yes, no, correct, or incorrect way, it's actually a, a difficulty score. Okay. So we've got four different names for it, right? So it's location on the ability parameter, um, which is theta or um, your latent variable. It can also be uh, thought of as difficulty of an item for uh, correct and incorrect responses. Um, and basically it's the point here at which you're likely to get, you're right on 50-50. So if I draw, if I think here of drawing a line over and I'm coming straight down, this is a little over negative one. So right at this item here, this is on the lower end of the ability scale. So if I'm thinking about this as a test question, it's an easier question. Okay. If I look at this blue item and I come over 50-50 and come down, this is a right around 1, and so that is a more difficult question, where 0 would be an average level question. Okay. So this item is more difficult than this item, or if you're thinking about this in a um, sort of a meaning or your other continuous latent variable way, this item measures people who score higher better, and this item measures people who score lower better. Okay. The other, another parameter we're going to use is A, and A is discrimination. And discrimination is really useful because it tells me how well the item measures. Okay, so it's the steeperness at, the steeperness, I'm making up words now, the steepness at the sort of 50-50 point. And so it measures by drawing a line at 50-50 and seeing how steep it is. So it is a slope, um, if you want to think about it as slope. And the larger the A value, the better the items. Now, um, you have to remember that sometimes you will get unrealistic parameters. Like if you get an A of 35, something's wrong. Um, so generally A's of 1 are considered good, 1 and greater. Um, because that means it's fairly discriminable at that 50-50 point. So steeper slopes are better. Okay. Also, most of the time you want your A's to be positive because that indicates that higher scores are actually higher. So um, as people get it right, they're making an overall higher ability. And as people are getting it wrong, they're lower ability. Or on a more continuous uh, measure. So if I have a 1 to 7 Likert scale, if I'm picking 7, I should get a higher score on the overall exam. If I'm picking 1s, I should get a lower total score, just mathematically. 
And so if you have a negative parameter, that means people who are picking high values are getting lower scores, and that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, usually that indicates that you forgot to reverse code it. But uh, negative item discriminations are usually not good. So we want the scores to be over 1. C is the guessing parameter. Now this is really more particular to um, dichotomous right-wrong sort of uh, testing procedures. And so C here is the, the sort of lower level of guessing. So it's actually the y-intercept for the, the logistic curve. Uh, and this graph has all of them on it. So here's A, here's B, the 50-50 point. Um, but C here is sort of like when, when sometimes people get it right just because the answer looks right. Um, so C is not always used, but can be really useful um, in cases where you um, are trying to weed out questions that are too easy to guess. So most th common three types of models for um, dichotomous IRT is a run parameter logistic or 1PL. This is often called a Roche model, and it only uses B. So it forces all of the guessing parameters to be zero. Ow. Um, and it forces all of the slopes to be the same. So uh, you'll get an estimate of the slope, but they're all um, forced to be equal, which isn't, to me personally, um, really a good idea. Because some items are created better than others, and some items are bad. And if your purpose is to weed out bad items, uh, you should probably estimate how good they are, the discriminability. Um, however, rush models are very popular because they are the simplest model. Um, and it really allows you to pick items at different points of ability to make sure you get a wide range of information. Um, but I would say now that we understand we, uh, the, 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 the royal we, I say now that um, it's a little easier to estimate these models, um, people are moving away from those. A um, 2PL is a popular model. It uses B and A, so it allows you to estimate location and discriminability. So it allows you to, to see if items, how good they are at their location. So if it measures on an average level, how well does it measure on that level? Um, and we'll use some examples of 2PLs. I'm not going to do a 1PL because um, if you can do a 2PL, you can do a 1PL. You just take out. A estimation. Um, a three parameter logistic model, also fairly popular in the sort of testing realm, where I add guessing. So we would estimate how guessable items are. Um, when you move to using uh, polytomous item scales, which are your ordered categories, um, you don't include guessing because people don't guess those. There's no right or wrong answer. And so what we'll actually use is a 2PL. Um, now the math on this is super fun times, um, but, and so if you're interested in learning more about IRT, I really suggest looking at how these are estimated to understand this better. Um, but if you're just interested in the basic concepts, these are the differences between the models. All right, this is a full information method because it uses their response patterns like we talked about instead of the correlation table to estimate those patterns. Now this is a logistic distribution, so there is a transformation and there is a transformation constant. And that is not something I don't, I don't really, really, unless you're really interested in the math, need to understand what that constant is doing. But if someone asks you which constant you're using, the two, program, the two things I'm going to show you today are using this d equals 1.7 const transformation constant, um, and that is very common. Okay, so they are transforming the data from those patterns to probabilities um, using, we're going to use uh, Logit. All right, so to sum this section up before I move on to polytomous IRT is that with item factor analysis and item response theory, they can be converted mathematically back and forth for dichotomous items. However, I would suggest picking a, which one you're going to run um, based on your goals. So as you can see, they're just very different approaches. So with uh, factor analysis, I'm focusing on dimensionality and um, are those items good? So the kind of where we started with EFA, 
Um, but with IRT, I was just totally different question. So where does this item measure? That to me is the most interesting thing because it allows me to say, this item only measures at the bottom. This item only measures at the top. We should find items that measure in the middle as well. Um, how good is the item at measuring? So with uh, factor analysis, we sort of get that by the weight. So higher weighted items are more related to their factor, um, but it's not quite the same thing. Um, and I also can estimate guessing if necessary. So these two analyses, while math, math wise, very similar, um, different theoretical orientations. All that said, we're gonna do a, an example of dichotomous IRT, but we're also gonna do an example of polytomous IRT. So polytomous means multiple options. Um, but with the focus on yes, no, and correct, or correct responses, that is a little easier because you either get it right or you get it wrong, or you get it yes or you get it no. So um, a separate type of IRT focuses on multiple category data, so it's called polytomous IRT. Um, this is not multidimensionality, this is multiple response options. Um, and those options are typically ordered. Now we often treat these things as continuous because with at least four of them, mildly continuous, but this is a way to not treat them as continuous and use it to your advantage. But they need to be ordered. And this is something you can test for. So in our example, we'll look at this, where people, when I pick a low number on the scale, so let's say a one to seven scale, I'm gonna get a low score overall. Um, if I pick a high number on the scale, I'm gonna get a high score overall. So if I pick half and half, I should get somewhere in the middle as an average. But low scores are tied to low response options and high scores are tied to high response options and they don't jump around. So this is a way to test if your seven item, um, seven item, seven options on your item uh, is truly doing what you think it's doing. Or do some of the, um, response options kind of move around, meaning people who pick sevens are actually scoring in the middle um, and people who pick fives are scoring even lower. So like, it's a way to look and make sure that the, the scale is appropriately ordered. So there's a couple of types of models for these and they're, not, they're just different um, estimations of these models. They're not a closed form solution. So uh, just like West of SEM, it is an iterative process. So sometimes they fail to converge, sometimes they don't work and you need tons and tons and tons of people for these to work. Because think about it, the more items you have, the more response, possible response patterns you're gonna get, especially with polytomous data. And so working with very small samples, it just ain't gonna work. Um, to quote the person who taught me IRT, you know, simple question, how many people do you need? And he said, how many ever runs? Which isn't helpful. Um, I have seen estimates from 500 to 1,000. So these, these types of designs do require a lot of participants because you're focusing on response patterns. And the more items you have, the more patterns are possible, right? So it's the number of items factorial. Um, so with three items, it's, um, it's eight possible response response patterns. Um, so you just really have to, um, oh, it's not three factorial. It's uh, the number of response patterns to the number of items or something to that effect, whatever. There's tons of options. Um, so you do have to have a lot of people. That being said, these are different ways to estimate um, and they work better in different situations, but there's a graded response model um, a generalized partial credit model, which is the one we're probably going to use, uh, not probably, we are, uh, or a partial credit model. And the last two are very similar. Um, so let me talk about each one of those. Okay. So a graded response model, um, quick pause. The great thing about doing this in R, switching between the two is one little, like, little phrase. So you can try these different, um, different estimations from Plutimus IRT, um, and kind of compare them against each other and see what you get. But anyways, a graded response model is definitely the simplest way to estimate um, for polytomous data. It is a 2PL, but it has problems fitting because sometimes your model is not that simple. Okay, so what it does, let's say you have seven categories. It takes those categories minus one. So I've got six boundary points. The boundary between one and two, two and three, three and four, etc. 
But the way this one actually works is it creates you some little mini 2PLs for each boundary, but it does kind of um, contrast coding. So it does one versus the rest, and then two versus the rest, and that's higher. So it kind of does little mini dichotomous 2PLs for uh, if I got a one or everything else, and a two or everything else, and a three or everything else. Now it's everything else on the upper end. So you will get the probability of scoring at that level or higher. So we get the, um, the location for each of those boundaries. So you'll get the B value for each one. And you would expect the B values for one versus the rest and then two versus the rest to be in order. Um, so one, one versus all should have the lowest location parameter. Okay. And you'll also get an overall A. So um, it kind of gives you all together, this is the slope for this item. So you still get overall picture of how discriminable the item is ac across each of these boundaries, but then you can look at each individual sort of cut point for items. Okay. The more popular generalized partial credit model and partial credit models account for the fact that Categories don't always get used equally. Anyone who's given scales of this type knows that they just don't always. Um, sometimes people never pick three. And it's just a thing. Um, you still get many 2PLs for uh, categories, but instead of being one versus everything, it's one to two, two to three, three to four, blah, 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 etc. Okay. Um, which is good because it sort of gives you a threshold of the difference between the lowest items to the next item to the next item versus like kind of one to an average of everything. Um, if my categories are ordered, which is what you want, um, and they really are in order, uh, these two will often, um, these two meaning a generalized, or any kind of partial credit model and a graded response model often end up giving the same estimation. If your categories uh, aren't quite ordered, or if you have, um, options that are never the most popular, I'll get there in, that, in just a second on the next slide, then you're going to get pretty different answers for these two. I would say that a generalized partial credit model is more popular simply because item ordering isn't always a thing and item and um, having each category be equally useful isn't always a thing. Um, and so a problem you'll run into with this model is if three never gets picked. So it's hard to pick when three is going to happen because it never happened or it only happened very infrequently. Okay, so to talk about that point, um, a concern with any type of one of these models, but especially partial credit, is that categories should have points where they're the most likely answer. Okay. So instead of having an item characteristic curve, what you're going to see instead is this sort of set of curves. So what's happening here? And I stole this from my IRT instructor because it was so beautiful. <laughs> so thanks, Billy. Um, running along the bottom here is still uh, ability or theta on both of these. This is still probability. But now instead of having one S curve, we're going to have several cut points. So each line here represents the likelihood of a single choice. So in this example, it only has four options. So like strongly disagree, disagree, agree, and strongly agree if you want. And so it gives you the likelihood of each option. So at the very bottom of the ability or the trait measurement, it's not really ability anymore. Um, so for meaning, if I have no meaning, I'm like 100% likely to pick the lowest answer. And what we're looking for here is the boundary condition here. So at a little over negative one is where I'm going to flip from picking one to two. So a little less than one Z score on my meaning scale, people flip from one to two. And two is the most likely from here to here because it's the only, it's the top one here. And then right at, um, you can tell this is beautiful made up data, right at the average score, people flip from two to three. And then here, three is most popular, and here's where they flip from three to four. Okay. And so really, between one through four, I'm only catching about um, a one, to, uh, one standard deviation around the mean. So everything else from that is like, you know, people are picking the ends. 
Um, this version of it is a, a problem because you do not have where each of the categorical options are likely at some point. So one is likely here to here, and then two is likely to here, and then it flips to four. And three is never a most likely option. So that means that people just aren't picking it. It's not a useful number. You should collapse the scale and make it three items because really they're not using three. They're only using, th they're, they're only using one, two, and four. And so why do you have three in there? And so this can be a problem. These are usually considered bad items or items that need collapsing of their categories. So to run this, what we're gonna do is install Mert. Now, the cool thing about Mert is it actually will run your simple dichotomous models as well, um, but I'm gonna use the code from the book uh, to do the dichotomous items, the LTM, because knowing more packages can't hurt you, um, but you can actually do um, 2PLs, 3PLs in a dichotomous way using Mert, and the uh, outputs are very similar and the code is very similar so you can kind of transfer between the two. So knowing two packages would is good. Um, we won't be covering multi-dimensional or multi-group IRT, but Mert can do both of those. That's actually what it stands for is multi-dimensional IRT. And what I'm gonna do in those examples is go over more of how to understand this. So I've kind of briefly covered the concepts for IRT and this is not a thorough overview at all. Um, so some other things that we'll talk about in the example, just cause it's much easier when you're looking at numbers is item information curves. So I showed you item characteristic curves where we could talk about location and ability and um, A, how steep it is and guessing but that can also be converted to an item information curve. So where are we getting the most information about people? So it'll peak at B. Um, and so that sort of tells me, uh, gives me a histogram of where the data is the prettiest. Instead of being a cumulative distribution function like log, it's a probability distribution function, which is what a histogram is. Um, and so it's kind of neat because you can flip back and forth. Uh, we can talk about test information curves. So across the entire exam, if you will, or the entire scale, where am I getting the most information? Am I, am I getting stuff about on average and then it I, um, scales out like a normal distribution? Or is this scale only assessing people at the top well? Or is this scale only assessing people at the bottom well? So we're gonna pick on another professor or two other professors for um, some scales or and some tests that they gave that are way too easy. And so you can see that they're only measuring the bottom pretty well. Um, we're gonna look at those coefficients, B, A, and C. And then when we look at polydamous items, we're gonna look at A, so how, how discriminable is the item and multiple B parameters. Um, person fit, so um, how, uh, how, what is the estimate of a person's score? That's their factor score, sorry. So person fit, how does the model fit for people? Are there any oddball persons? Item fit, so how good is each individual item? Um, item information curves, we just, I just talked about, and item characteristic curves, and then test function curves as well. So we're gonna get into more of like, how do I interpret these ideas for IRT in the example video, which is next.